Okay, can you can you see that now? Yep. You can yes. see that? Okay. So just going back, basically just a couple of strides on the silicosis, I think it's very topical. So basically, the even in, in the 300s, uh, silica was recognised because you can see a, a, uh, on the top of one of the hills in Italy, uh, you can see uh, one of the chaps there that was cutting stone that had a way around it, his arm's length down to his feet to avoid the uh, chips and dust from the stone. So in Hawk's Nest Tunnel in, in the US, between 1930 and 1935, 476 to 1,000 deaths from silicosis when that tunnel was being constructed. And they thought as a result of that, well, we know about this now, uh, silicosis in the future should be a should be becoming a negligible disease, but it certainly hasn't. And the, we, we uh, got onto this relatively early in Queensland when Anthony White, who was diagnosed with severe silicosis and he died, about a year or so after diagnosis. And he had been using, uh, in, in his employments, a lot of Caesar stone. But even then, the A, the companies that were using the, making the bench stops, and B, the regulators were not uh, paying much attention to the small factories that were manufacturing the uh, artificial stone. And even here, it says that, the, um, that there is prolonged damage uh, can cause, can be, cause a result of repeated exposure and inhalation. And you know the, the safety things do not handle and all the safety structures have been understood. None of the workers read any of that. Don't breathe it in for long periods of time and avoid exposure, et cetera. That was totally ignored. So reservoir crystalline silica, it, it's present in soil, granite, et cetera. It becomes inhalable or respirable when the particles are small enough to enter the airways to the lower parts of the lung. And that's involved in you know, coal, hard rock mining, metal, metalliferous mines, stonemasons, construction workers, tunnel workers is also very important. Even in Sydney in, in the early 70s, when, the, when some of the tunnels were being uh, constructed, a lot of people developed silicosis during that period. So the silica is inhaled, it gets into the alveoli, the small air sacs in the lung, it's taken up by macrophages which clean up the airways, and then it causes damage to the macrophages, they disintegrate and you get fibrosis and, and scar tissue formed. And the typical feature of, a, of silicosis is these very dense nodules. You can see the dense uh, nodule and scar tissue here. And on a CT scan, this is what the nodules look like. So that is the sort of thing that we're looking for. And the silicotic nodules uh, with high resolution CT scans, you can see these nodules here. On this view of the scan, you see uh, lots of nodules in the upper zones, and that's uh, where they're found. And then the histology, if we, we don't need to biopsy these people these days, but in previous days gone past, you can see that the, when they look at it under the microscope, they're very solid nodules. Uh, so that that's why they show up so densely on the CT scan. So how is it diagnosed? The most important thing is to get a very detailed occupational and clinical history. And that needs to be reviewed by an occupational physician or a spiritual physician. You need to see how much dust they've been exposed to, have they had any symptoms, and then they need investigations, such as detailed breathing tests to see if there's any abnormality in lung function testing, and then a chest X-ray graded to the International Labor Organization standards. And both profusion grade and the nature of the nodules have to be detected. Uh, if HRCT, high resolution CT scan, uh, needs, can be done either to confirm the diagnosis or as I'll describe later, if people who have got a normal chest X-ray but have had a heavy exposure, then they need to have a CT scan because we then find out that they really have silicosis. There is a pathway in uh, the, the pathway uh, in Queensland is that work cover screened the stonemasons and the Department of Mines and Energy screened the coal workers. And this came about that these coal workers started to be screened because in 2015 we noted coal mine dust lung disease. They believed that it didn't exist here between 1984 and 2015. It's just the screening program was, fl was flawed because the x-rays weren't re reported by someone who knew how to report chest x-rays. Uh, 
and lung function was done very poorly. So now a chest X-ray read to international labor organization standards and lung function testing done by, uh, by someone who knows how to do it. And then if they, if the doctor's looking after them, if that's all okay, then that's fine and have another re review after a few years. If it was abnormal, then they have to be seen by a respiratory physician and have further testing. So the silicosis diagnosis was really based on the history of exposure. If people have had 10 to 30 years of exposure and they develop silicosis, that's chronic silicosis. Accelerated silicosis can occur with less than 10 years of exposure. And the challenges in diagnosis is, A, the respiratory physician's interpretation of the patient's occupational history, the chest X-ray versus high resolution CT scan, and most days, most times now we don't need a biopsy. But, but even with the biopsy, you've got to have a pathologist that, that is experienced in, in looking at lung tissue to make an adequate diagnosis because there are a number of differential diagnoses. So the typical case of silicosis is the history of exposure, nodules on chest X-ray or high resolution CT scan, symptoms of breathlessness, wheezing, cough, and reduced lung function with airway obstruction. Uh, minimum requires the important in the case of negative ILO chest X-ray, and there are features on this HRCT. So in Queensland, um, the many workplaces are, are present with around about three people per workplace. So they're small factories. They tend to work with predominantly engineered stone. This is the sort of dust exposure that they're exposed to. So just imagine working there 45 hours a week. Uh, and being exposed to that sort of dust uh, through the whole of that time. It's just untenable. So they didn't have, there was no wet cutting, it was all dry. There was no adequate extraction fans and the types of masks that were used weren't very effective. There's just these little paper masks that were, that were uh, used. And most of the people, they say that there's thick air dust, they can't see across the thing. They blew dust boogers in inverted commas out of their nose. Uh, gritty teeth, clothes of hair were covered. And to comp compound things, that before going home, they blew the dust off themselves with compressed air. So that just got different people, uh, much created a lot more dust into their breathing environment as well. And a lot of them were saying they had to wash, they used to have a different washing machine so that their clothes could be washed because it just made such a mess of the, of the machine and also a mess of the... Um, of the, the other clothes. And also the other thing is the passive exposure. So people working in a factory where this work was going on, even if they weren't doing dry cutting or, or shaping, or they're just in the vicinity, they also got large exposure to silica dust. So in, the, um, in, in our screening process, all work cover offered all of the workers in the silica industry uh, assessment. So if they had abnormality, they were referred to a respiratory physician to have further investigations. If there was no abnormality, then they weren't referred. Except if we, they, we also had the ability to do high resolution CT scans of the chest because we published a paper in early on showing that uh, one third of the patients who were screened had severe radiological disease, but they didn't always show up on the uh, plain chest X-ray. So if people have had heavy exposure, uh, they do need a CT scan for diagnosis if the chest X-ray is normal. So of the first uh, few people, 16% had an ILO grade of one or one zero, which is a positive test. And one third of those, 4.9% uh, screened, had severe radiological disease with a much higher ILO grade. And that indicates fairly severe disease. They were laborers, polishers, finishers, sawmen, shapers, laminators, and they um, just created all of that. The first 81 screened, um, aged, they were young, 22 to 53, 80% had smoked. They, most of them didn't have the regular GP. They worked in, they, these population tend to change workplaces fairly often, uh, chasing better deals or better uh, wages or, or better, better um, workplace things and very few had qualifications that could be transferred to other industries. 
Now, a comparison between the stone type workers and the mine workers, the stone beach type workers were much younger than the, uh, the, the blue was the um, stone bench type workers and the red dots are the um, positive people with silicosis that had um, silicosis. So the, the coal mine workers were much older or the hard rock miners workers were much older because they had lower, uh, they had you know, chronic exposure. The, the, the exposure wasn't so high. Some of these people in the, in the young age group developed silicosis after only working three to four years in the industry, which is pretty, um, it just underlies the severity of the, of, the, um, of the exposure that they suffered. So this is an example of a 63 year old stonemason. He had chronic silicosis, 45 years since his previous exposure. And, and he was mainly uh, doing natural stone and mainly dry cutting. And he was in the cemeteries creating headstones and various things like that. Or, and also they did some work uh, putting up sandstone uh, buildings and so forth. So this is just fairly typical with these uh, multiple nodules in the upper lobes uh, and showing um, the silicosis. This was a 27 year old stonemason. He was only 10 years, less than 10 years since his first exposure. The chest X-ray was quite abnormal with these fluffy infiltrates in the upper zones, plus a lot of nodules, and on the CT scan, this is just terrible. He's got a lot of nodules, but also progressive massive fibrosis. So that's where these nodules have coalesced and form this. Any, if they coalesce and form a, a, an area of more than one centimetre, then that indicates uh, the, the uh, PMF. So you can see this is really quite, this is two or three centimetres. Uh, so, and, and these people didn't have any screening, that even though they're being exposed to large amounts of dust, they were not screened. There's there no requirement for them to be screened prior to um, 2018. And this is another chap, um, again, less than 10 years exposure. And this chap they had a, a CT scan in 2018, showed progressive massive fibrosis, but even 12, not even 12 months later in March 2019, the areas of the PMF had really expanded. These are the same views, same cuts, but you can see the it's much greater and denser, even over nine months uh, progression. So that's really terrible. So the, the, the chest X-ray basically has a lower sensitivity to detect nodules. So that's why we say, well, look, if we get a normal chest X-ray, we need a CT scan. This is a, an example of that, a 35 year old stone mason with accelerated silicosis, a normal chest X-ray. At, at when he had it, but, and that was repeated by a B reader. And the same B reader reported this, but you can see on this CT scan, all the, apart from the blood vessels, that all these nodules, all these little nodules here, through both lungs, I'm oh, no, sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, through both lungs um, on the CT scan. So that just demonstrates how much more sensitive a CT scan is to a chest X-ray. And this is also important in changing, in chasing, in following these patients, because some of the um, respiratory people looking after them are just doing progress chest X-rays. So that if you've got someone who's maybe feeling a bit worse, uh, but it still has a, a normal chest X-ray, uh, even if they had a CT scan initially that showed this, then they probably need follow up with CT scans to see whether there's any progressive deterioration. This was a, a construction worker, uh, two years heavy exposure, mixing dry cement. So dry cement's got a lot of silica in it, but it's also got nasty other cement um, uh, products. And that produced silicosis and progressive massive fibrosis just after two years of heavy exposure. So there's a number of industries that we need to be looked at. Chronic uh, coal mining, of course, chronic silicosis. This chap had more than 10 years. He was an open cut miner. Now it used to be thought that open cut mining didn't cause uh, severe coal mine dust lung disease, but it's certainly been shown that you know, people with open cut coal mining can have significant dust exposure, either working near the wash plant or the coral hole processing plant, or down in the doing drilling, um, drilling for the for shot firing, or even the pump crews. Uh, 
And this chap removed overburden and drilling. They didn't work any masks because he was working in a cabin, but he still had a lot of dust exposure and developed silicosis. A hard rock, hard, an exposure to hard rock and coal mining. So we have a lot of uh, some of these people with very soft nodules on the CT scan, but also hard nodules. The soft nodules tend to be more of coal workers and the harder nodules, the uh, associated with silica and also calcified lymph nodes in the center part of the chest are associated with silica. Now, the other thing we looked at was to see, okay, we've got these patients with progressive massive fibrosis. Can we predict those who are going to progress and, and how rapidly? Now, it's still in the experimental stages, but we started to do PET scans, um, which is a, where you inject radioactive labeled sugar and see whether it's taken up. Now, PET scans are mainly used for looking at lung cancer to see whether shadows are positive, but it can be also positive where there's a lot of inflammation. And in this areas of progressive massive fibrosis, in this uh, patient in, in here and here, the PET scan was very hot. So now, unfortunately, this has also been interpreted uh, at, in, North, in some of the hospitals in North Queensland as being lung cancer, when in fact it's silicosis with progressive massive fibrosis. So that's one of the traps that we have to be aware of that just because it's hot on PET scan, it doesn't mean it's lung cancer. So need, you know, if that's the suspicion, they need to do a biopsy of it before considering surgery because I've seen a couple of these patients that had part of their lung removed and that's the worst thing you can do in um, managing people with silicosis and PMF. Um, so basically, silica can, it's, it's working in various industries are exposed. It causes irreversible damage to the lung. There are some studies now in 2020 uh, published by the Spanish group that showed over a four year period, uh, stone benchtop workers did progress in terms of reduction in lung function and progression of their disease. And then the, the other question comes as well, are these people gonna die from the disease? And the chances are, if they're progressing, they will. But at this stage, some of the ones that we've developed, we've diagnosed, have had fairly early disease because they've had CT scans. So sometimes that um, rate of progression is not always clear until they've been observed for four or five years. Um, so it's an interesting, it's, it's a severe problem. It's a problem that shouldn't happen because they should have been screened and dust levels monitored. Now, Australia-wide, they've got to have all wet factories. They've got to... Uh, change their clothes before they go home at night and, and wash and so forth to get rid of all the excess dust. So I'm happy to take any questions. I hope that's been uh, useful. Um, that was fascinating. I, I learned a huge amount about that, Dr. Edwards. That was incredible. Um, let me see, are there questions in the chat? So what are the available treatment options? So at the moment, there's, the, the major thing is prevention and observation. Now, if people sometimes in the very early silicosis, we see patients, uh, workers who have got very soft shadows in their lung. Now, there is a trial going on at Prince Charles Hospital in Brisbane where they're doing, they do a bronchoscopy and a, and a, and a small wash of the lung to see, and if they've got very high levels of silica load, then the theory is that if you can wash that out, uh, that may make a difference to the prognosis and progression of the disease. So this is people with very early disease without hard nodules and scarring. Mm -hmm. And so that translates then to a whole lung lavage. And what that means is people are put to sleep, they put a tube into each lung, one lung is blocked off, and they're ventilated on that lung, and the other lung is filled up with about a litre of, of, uh, of saline fluid, warm saline. Wow. And then that's washed out, and the, the usually the first return is all cloudy, and that's repeated 10, 12, 14 times or so until the, until the return is clear. And then the other lung is ventilated, that lung is ventilated, and the other lung is washed out. And some of the preliminary data suggests that that 
has made a difference to the CT scan in, in only four or five patients. So clearly, though, we've got to watch those and observe those to see, does it, we won't know for five years probably, will it make a difference to the progression of the disease? So that's one thing. The other thing is that if people have symptoms of airway obstruction and wheezing and cough and phlegm, then simple treatment for, um, like treating for people with COPD with, with, with inhalers may help. Secondly, the most important thing people need to do is stop smoking as well, because that'll make a difference. And then if we follow them and we see evidence of progression of the disease, uh, Deborah Yates in, in Sydney and David Deller up here are doing a trial of antifibrotic drugs. Now, they're the ones that are treated, that are used for treating pulmonary, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And there's some studies, there's some suggestions there that using those drugs may halt the rate of progression. It won't reverse it, but it may halt the rate of progression. And then in the, um, down Ryan Hoy in, in Melbourne, they've had a few people down there and in Sydney who have needed, they progressed so severely in respiratory failure, they had lung transplanta transplantation. Now, even with lung transplantation, whilst it makes a fantastic short recovery, the average survival is only about eight or 10 years. So, but it may, if they progressed and you know, over a five year period, they've got severe respiratory failure, not in their 30s, then lung transplantation will buy them another eight to 10 years of good quality life. Wow. So, there, it's really the most important thing is prevention that because it, so far our treatment options are limited, but probably the most positive one will be hopefully the antifibrotic agents that, that stop that progressive fibrosis and damage to the lung. Wow. Well, just as you said that, we had a question come in about uh, the, the validity and veracity of lung transplants. So you answered that. We have another question here. Are there specific masks or equipment that should be worn by these people to prevent this condition? Yeah, the, the, the most important thing is now is the, is the wet, wet processing and also to keep the floors wet all the time and not let it dry out. So it's dust prevention and reduction. And then they should also be wearing at least a P3 mask, which is a type of quality of mask, or a cartridge filter mask, or even better, an independent airstream hood. So they've got their mask on, they've got a cylinder at the back, and that feeds filtered clean air into their breathing environment. Right. So that's the gold standard of the mask, the independent air fed hood. Wow. That, that will reduce the, du the dust exposure to them. Okay, another question here for you. How do you tell if the fibrosis is idiopathic versus attributable to dust exposure and what evidence is required to establish this causation? Uh, idiopathic, by definition, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis means that we don't know the cause of the fibrosis. In other words, there's no occupational history. There's no other potential cause of the fibrosis. So people with dust, with heavy dust exposure, be it silica, be it coal mine dust, and they, if they develop, or asbestos, if they develop uh, fibrosis, then it's due to that, provided they've had enough exposure, that fibrosis needs to be, re, uh, be attributed to the dust exposure. So that's this one of the, um, again, it's one of the features. Obviously, if they haven't had a history of dust exposure, or enough dust exposure, then it's idiopathic. So what, that's one of the difficult ones too. So if you've got people with asbestos workers that have had you know, a couple of years of exposure, but not heavy, and they've got pleural plaques, and they've got pulmonary fibrosis, then the question is, is that asbestosis or is it idiopathic fibrosis in a, in a person who's had exposure to asbestos? Because the, the general accepted thing is that, say, for example, you need to get to develop asbestosis, you need very heavy exposure for, say, one or two years. For, for example, as a lagger who is working with it every day and heavy exposure, or someone who used to be working in the James Hardy factory for two or three years, or if you're a carpenter and had intermittent exposure, at least 10 years exposure, to accumulate enough exposure to develop uh, asbestosis. Uh, 
And then these people in the, in the stone benchtop industry, because they've had such a heavy exposure, and you can see that photo there with the dust produced, um, they might, we've seen them as less than three years having severe disease. But otherwise, if they're just in the ordinary, say so if they're in the mining industry or in the, in the, um, in the, stone, in the um, headstone industry or building sandstone buildings, then they might need uh, 10 years exposure. Wow. That's amazing. Um, so thank you so much again for your time today. That was absolutely so informative, very interesting and a little bit scary. Um, thank you everybody for attending this talk. This recording will be made available to you within a couple of days, along with the presentation slides. And if you have any further questions or any information, please direct them to me and I can arrange for Dr. Edwards to answer your questions or get the information that you ask back to you. We look forward to having you at our future seminars. And again, we thank you very much, Dr. Robert Edwards, for being our special presenter today. Have a great one. Thank you, Michelle. Bye. Bye.